graduate award from the Robertson School of Government at Regent University in 2014. He has been with the Coolidge Foundation for just over a year. His talk today will explore Coolidge's crusade for lower taxes, responsible budgets, sensible immigration policies, and world peace. Please welcome Mr. Thompson. And she mentioned that I'm in charge of the Coolidge Foundation social media, so as a result, I'm going to take a picture of all of you, and it will end up on the Facebook page of the Coolidge Foundation. So, there you are. So look for yourselves, facebook.com forward slash Calvin Coolidge Foundation. <laughs> but anyways, we'll get into uh, the substance of the talk. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. I'm very grateful to be with you um, to share a little bit about the president that I work for. He's been deceased for more than 80 years now, but he still has employees, staffers, if you will. I like to say I work the Perpetual Coolidge Campaign. Um, and I'm going to elucidate for you some of the highlights of the 67 months in which Calvin Coolidge, the man from Plymouth Notch, was our nation's chief executive. Um, he became president in August of 1923, but there were 50 years of life before that. So before I go into the presidency, I would like to go over very briefly um, his biography prior to the presidency. President Coolidge was born um, in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, which is just about half an hour from here, on the 4th of July, 1872. He's the only president in American history to have been born on Independence Day. And we have a huge celebration in his honor every year at the 4th, on the 4th of July at the Coolidge Foundation at the historic site there. Um, and he was raised in Plymouth Notch, attended the one-room schoolhouse in Plymouth Notch until he was in high school, at which point he went on to Black River Academy down in Ludlow, Vermont, um, which was a private independent school run by the Baptist Church. And he boarded there for four years. Plymouth was about 11 miles, it's about 11 miles from Ludlow, but back in those days there were no cars, so he, he boarded in, in Ludlow. And then graduated from Black River in 1890, tried to get into Amherst, failed to get into Amherst, came back to Plymouth, lived for a year with his father, um, and then found out that he could go up to St. Johnsbury Academy in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, take a course there for a semester, and then get a certificate to be admitted to Amherst without having to take the entrance exam. So he went up to St. Jay's <laughs> for a semester. And then um, by the fall of 1891, he was a freshman at Amherst. He had a slow start at Amherst, but he, his classmates um, re recognized his better qualities, and he became a, a much better and more like student towards the end, actually to the point where um, he was able to join a fraternity. He was blackballed originally, but then he joined a fraternity later on. Amherst was a big Greek school in those days. And he was also selected in 1895 to give the Grove Oration, which is um, a major speech given by a student, selected by his peers at um, Amherst's commencement in 1895. And then, after he graduates from Amherst, he reads the law. He didn't go to law school. Back in those days, it was much more common um, for lawyers who didn't have lots of money to go to places like Harvard and Yale to just apprentice, and, and Coolidge apprenticed at the law firm of Hammond and Field in Northampton, Massachusetts, um, on the other side of the Connecticut River from Amherst. Um, he became a lawyer, and then almost immediately started running for office. Um, he was asked many years later what his main hobby was, and he said, running for office, which is hobby. <laughs> and, and as the um, timelines I handed out demonstrate, President Coolidge probably held more offices than any president on, in the lead up to the White House that um, I can think of. I, I can't think of another president who held um, as many offices. And literally from city council, he was elected to the Common Council of Northampton in 1898, and then worked his way up from um, city council to city solicitor of Northampton. Then he was the clerk of the county court in Hampshire County, Massachusetts. He ran for the school board in 1904, but that was before he met and married Grace Coolidge. Um, and when he lost that election to a man named John Kennedy, um, somebody asked why they didn't vote for him. He, that person said because he didn't have any kids. And Coolidge responded, well, it might, might give me time. Then he married Grace Coolidge from Burlington, Vermont, 
um, and started having babies. His first son was born in 1906, John, and then his second son, um, Calvin Jr., was born in 1908. Um, and then Coolidge never lost another election after he had sons. Uh, he was elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives in 1906. And then in um, 1909, he was elected mayor of Northampton, Massachusetts. In 1911, he was elected to the Massachusetts State Senate, representing Hampshire County. And then by 1914, he was elected president of the Massachusetts State Senate. Um, and he served in that position until he was elected lieutenant governor of Massachusetts in 1916. And then after several terms, these were all one-year terms back in those days in Massachusetts. Um, he was elected governor of Massachusetts in 1918. Um, and in his re-election campaign in 1919, a very key event took place in his political career, and that was the Boston police strike. Um, the police officers of Boston had not received a raise in about 30 years, and they decided to strike. Um, and by some quirk of law in Massachusetts at the time, the governor had direct authority over the city police force in Boston. Um, President Coolidge when confronted with this act of, of, um, of um, rebellion by the police force, the, the um, chaos that was reigning in the city of Boston, he took swift action and fired every last one of the police officers. And um, he issued a telegram to the founder of the American Federation of Labor, Samuel Gompers, where he had this famous line in it, there is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, anytime. And this was a very risky move for Coolidge to take because most of those police officers were new immigrants, um, they were Irish and Italian, uh, the, the, these were rising populations in Massachusetts, voting populations in Massachusetts at that time, so it was a, a huge risk. And this was September of 1919, the, the election in November of 1919, his first re-election. Um, but President Coolidge thought that maintaining public order was, was the most important thing to do. And the people of Massachusetts rewarded him for it and re-elected him. And not only that, but even President Woodrow Wilson uh, commended him for his actions in putting down that strike. And that whole episode put Coolidge on the national stage. Uh, we were going into a presidential election cycle in 1920, uh, and this was a contentious election in which President Wilson was going through the decline of his presidency, like many two-term presidents, the last two years or three years of Wilson's term were not felicitous for him. He had, in addition to having a stroke, um, he failed to get the League of Nations treaty passed through the Senate um, with the opposition of a very prominent Republican leader, Henry Cabot Lodge, who didn't care much about much for Coolidge. He was Coolidge was a, a swamp Coolidge from Western Massachusetts. Lodge lived in the Back Bay and was, you know, very hoity-toity and whatnot. Um, but and, and he just he, he had the lowest regard for President Coolidge and Governor Coolidge when he was governor. Uh, but anyway, so the country after and then also after the First World War, we were uh, in a lot of debt. Taxes were very high. Things were uh, there were there were instantiations of rebellion, and, and also you have to look at the Boston police strike in that context as well. Communism is a new thing, the Soviet Union was just created, the, the Russian Revolution had taken place just a few years earlier. We were really, the, the people of the country were really anxious about rebellion. Um, so a candidate like Calvin Coolidge um, and his running mate in 1920, Senator Warren Harding of Ohio, who was at the top of the ticket, he was selected in that famous um, smoke-filled room in the Chicago um, Hotel and at the Republican Convention of 1920 in Chicago. They selected after much wrangling with, with several other people as candidates, including General Leonard Wood, um, who was a World War I general, and Hiram Johnson, a senator from California. They eventually settled upon the um, loving, loving, affable Senator Warren Harding of Ohio. Um, he was the nominee. Then, by acclamation, the convention nominated Governor Calvin Coolidge of Massachusetts as the vice presidential candidate in 1920. So um, in that election, which was also the first election in which women were able to vote, so the, the um, 17th Amendment was passed in 1919, so in 1920, women had the vote. The Harding Coolidge ticket facing off against Governor James Cox of Ohio and this, um, this guy, some of you may have heard of, named Franklin Delano Roosevelt, is the VP candidate. 
1920, Harding and Coolidge made short work of both of them, won 60% of the vote nationwide, um, and a huge number of electoral votes, even breaking into the South, which was a huge thing in those days because the South was, because of the Civil War, was a heavily Democratic region. Um, Harding and Coolidge won Tennessee, Oklahoma, and Texas. So um, it was a, a, a major addition to every other state outside of the old Confederacy. So it was a huge election victory for the Republicans and huge majorities in, in both chambers of Congress as well. Um, so then Coolidge is vice president, hates the job because the vice president is not, you know, Joe Biden was on um, Stephen Colbert last night and he's very much involved in the, the planning of our policies in the, in the executive branch of the government these days, but back in those days, the vice president was literally just first in line to the throne and had nothing to do um, other than preside over the Senate, and that's what Coolidge did. And in his autobiography, he says that the one rule that um, is the most true about the United States Senate was that um, they will do whatever they want, whenever they want, and there's nothing the president of the Senate can do about it. <laughs> so, um, and, and that guy that I talked about earlier, Henry Cabot Lodge, was still the Republican leader of the Senate and um, just ran over Coolidge all the time. He really did not enjoy being vice president. But fortunately, well, not fortunately for Warren Harding, but fortunately for Coolidge, <laughs> um, he didn't have long to remain in the vice presidential chair because um, on the night, or the day of August 2nd, 1923. Warren Harding, our president, was out in the West in California on a big tour of the Western United States. President Obama was just in Alaska, the first president to visit the Arctic Circle. Um, well, President Warren Harding was the first president to visit Alaska, period. So he was out in Alaska and then down, he died um, on August 2nd, 1923 in San Francisco, California, from what the Rutland Herald the day, that day called a stroke of apoplexy. That's the headline from that day. Um, not exactly sure what that is, and we will never know, because Mrs. Harding did not allow an autopsy to be performed. Um, and in case you think that was because of you know, nefarious things, Florence Harding loved being first lady, and it took her a long time to move out of the White House after her time's up. Um, so, so I don't think it's very likely that Florence Harding would have killed her husband. Um, she, she loved being first lady. And, and was jealous of Grace Coolidge because she was so young and beautiful um, at the time. But I digress. So now we are um, to the, the meat of our discussion today, which begins on August 2nd, 1923, um, the presidency of our nation's 30th president, Calvin Coolidge. So on August 11th, 1924, he's running for re-election um, in November of 24, President Calvin Coolidge took to the lawn of the White House to record a message on what would become the first presidential film in American history. This newsreel, recorded by DeForest Phono Films, came just before uh, the 1924 election, in which Calvin Coolidge, the Republican standard bearer, faced Democratic nominee John W. Davis, who was a former Wall Street attorney, um, solicitor general in the Wilson administration, and our former ambassador to the United Kingdom. Um, and Progressive Party nominee Robert W. La Follette, who was actually a Republican senator from Wisconsin, but was not happy about the rightward shift of the Republican Party um, under Harding and Coolidge. Um, in this speech, Coolidge outlined the heart and soul of his political philosophy, his beliefs about the limited role of the federal government, tax reduction, and fiscal responsibility. The president said, and I quote, I want the people of America to be able to work less for the government and more for themselves. I want them to have the rewards of their own industry. This is the chief meaning of freedom. Until we can reestablish a condition under which the earnings of the people can be kept by the people, we are bound to suffer a severe and distinct curtailment of our liberty." Unquote. Thus, Coolidge launched the fall campaign in which he would sue for a policy of economy and government, debt reduction, tax reduction, and economic liberty. At Harding's sudden passing on the 2nd of August, 1923, Calvin Coolidge was called to the presidency. He had been holidaying with his wife at his father's home in Plymouth Notch, Vermont. When asked what thought first came to mind on receiving the news of his elevation to the White House, he replied, I think I can swing it. <laughs> 
He was famously sworn into office by his father, Colonel John Coolidge, a notary public, and a million other things as well, state senator, farmer, um, business owner, haberdasher, clerk of the courts, the uh, school superintendent, the collector of the snow tax, you, you name it, Colonel John probably did it. Um, and this inauguration took place in the parlor of the family homestead uh, by the light of a kerosene lamp. This symbol event captures then, as it still captures today, the imagination of a nation. Although not everyone was thrilled by the news, our good friend Senator Lodge, on the day, a reporter called Coolidge's old rival and to get his reaction when the news came out late that evening. The old senator was not pleased to be awakened, and with, while the reporter was making his apologies, Lodge, having put two and two together, suddenly cut through with his response, my god, that means Coolidge is president. <laughs> with his belief in local and state government as the true engines of democracy. Coolidge necessarily held a narrow Jeffersonian view regarding the functions of national government. Indeed, his views on the subject were much more in keeping with those of Grover Cleveland, the Democratic president of his youth, than with those progressives like Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. As president, he respected and honored states' rights. He often spoke of the essential basic role of state and local governments in our political system. What we need, he preached, is not more federal government, but better local government. Frankly, few of his contemporaries paid him much heed on that score, for they had learned to love, even in those pre-New Deal days, the dollars flowing into their communities from Washington for such popular projects as highway construction. As president, Coolidge made himself into the nation's chief administrator, de-emphasizing his role as a political leader, like Dwight Eisenhower would later do. His primary concern was reducing the deficit, cutting taxes, maintaining tariff stability, and making the government run efficiently and effectively. In these tasks, he more than excelled. Particularly notable was Coolidge's skillful use of the newly created Bureau of the Budget in bringing order and direction to the budgeting process, and thereby achieving the savings and efficiencies in government that he sought. He met with his budget director, Herbert Mayhew Lord, on a weekly basis. As president, Coolidge achieved his principal objectives of debt reduction and tax reform, along with downsizing the federal government to reflect post-war needs. When he left office, he did so knowing that he had been a good and faithful servant, his stewardship well done. It is to the Coolidge record of legislative accomplishment that we now turn. I'd like to discuss a number of bills Coolidge signed that reflect well upon his overall political philosophy, and uh, preeminent among these were the so-called Coolidge Mellon of other legislative items, including the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act, the Indian Citizenship Act, and Coolidge's veto record. So now a little bit of background on this guy Mellon, Andrew Mellon, who was a very key figure in the 1920s. Uh, Mellon belonged to a remarkable generation uh, which wit wit witnessed the creation and accumulation of individual fortunes in unprecedented abundance by such notables as Rockefeller, Ford, Carnegie, Morgan, and Frick. But among these figures, Mellon was unique in that he excelled in four fields of endeavor, as a businessman and a banker, as a politician and statesman, as an art collector, and as a philanthropist. The Mellons were Protestant immigrants from Northern Ireland who had settled in Western Pennsylvania in 1818. At an early age, Andrew joined his father Thomas and his brother Richard in the management of the family bank, T. Mellon and Sons which soon became the prime financial agent in the transformation of Western Pennsylvania into one of the richest industrial regions in the United States during 40 years before World War II. Or, I'm sorry, but before the First World War. Andrew Mellon was an extraordinary judge of entrepreneurial talent, and among the many companies he helped found and fund were Alco Alcoa, Carborundum, Coppers, and Gulf Oil. He rarely interested himself in the details of such businesses, but he acquired extensive holdings which meant that by 1914, he was one of the richest men in the United States. So think of, actually, I think of him like a Mitt Romney type of figure, a venture capitalist who went out and funded um, businesses and then became very, very wealthy as a result. But uh, Mellon was still um, almost unknown outside of Pittsburgh. It was only his appointment as Secretary of the Treasury in 1921 by President Warren Harding, which turned him into a national figure. 
He had long been active in Republican politics in Pennsylvania, and he was strongly opposed to the League of Nations, and he delighted in bringing business practices to government. <coughs> During his long period of office, which stretched uh, from the beginning of the Harding administration almost to the end of the Hoover administration, it was said of him at the time that three presidents served under him. <laughs> uh, Mellon cut taxes, enforced prohibition, presided over a period of such unprecedented financial prosperity that he was hailed as the greatest treasury secretary since Alexander Hamilton. The rate of tax coming out of the Great War topped out at 77% for income over a million dollars due to the necessity of funding the troops in Europe. During the Harding administration, the rates were reduced substantially with the Revenue Act of 1921. In 1922, the combined top marginal normal and surtax rate was reduced to 58% from 73%, then to 50% in 1923 on incomes over $200,000. The Revenue Act of 1924, which was signed by President Coolidge and maneuvered through, con through Congress with the assistance of Secretary Mellon, reduced rates retroactively for 1923. And by 1924, the top rate had come down to 46% of income over $500,000. After that initial round of tax cuts, Coolidge and Mellon continued to cut. His Revenue Act of 1926, the crowning achievement of the Coolidge administration, lowered the top rate again, this time all the way down to 25% for incomes over $100,000. Because that act as well was retroactive, the 25% rate was in place from 1925 to 1928. This is even lower than Ronald Reagan's top rate of 28%. Andrew Mellon provided a worthy rationale for the 1920s tax policies in his book, Taxation, the People's Business. Mellon noted that many wealthy individuals had placed large amounts of money into tax sheltering financial instruments, such as municipal bonds, um, instead of investing that money in the private economy, all in order to avoid paying the steep rates of tax under President Wilson. And this is a quote from Taxation, the People's Business. The history of taxation shows that taxes which are inherently excessive are not paid. The high rates inevitably put pressure upon the taxpayer to withdraw his capital from productive business and invest it in tax-exempt securities or to find other lawful methods of avoiding the realization of taxable income. The result is that the sources of taxation are drying up. Wealth is, fall is failing to carry a share of the tax burden and capital is being diverted into channels which yield neither revenue to the government nor profit to the people." Unquote. This trend was reversed with the enactment of the Harding Coolidge tax cuts. As a result of these policies, the general economy of the 1920s flourished. Economic productivity increased, as did employment and income levels along with it. During the Coolidge presidency, industrial production increased 70%. Real earnings for wage earners grew 22% and unemployment averaged 3.3% for the six years President Coolidge was in the White House. Truly, Calvin Coolidge was the right man at the right place at the right time. Not only that, but the government actually collected more tax revenue in many of the years um, after the Coolidge tax cuts were enacted than before. As a result of a growing economy and so many high-income high earners decided to invest their money instead of sheltering. In fact, not only did high-income earners pay a larger amount of taxes, but they also paid a higher percentage of all taxes. One figure shows that during the height of, of the Coolidge presidency, 98% of the American people had no income tax liability whatsoever. Perhaps most importantly, Coolidge used his tax accomplishments to help pay down the national debt. By the time Coolidge left office, the national debt was lowered to $16.9 billion in 1929, from $22.3 billion in 1923 and the federal budget was reduced to $3.3 billion in 1929 from $5.1 billion in 1921, making Coolidge the only president in the last 90 years to leave the federal government smaller when he left office than it was when he became president. So now we'll move on to the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act, one of my sadly least favorite aspects of President Coolidge's record. Immigration was a contentious issue in the 1920s. Labor union leaders, including Samuel Gompers, the, the founder of the American Federation of Labor, enthusiastically supported congressional plans to severely restrict legal immigration. Domestic workers would confront less competition and enjoy greater leverage with employers. Restrictionist legislation had been championed 
by one of Vermont's own former U.S. Senators, William P. Dillingham. Dillingham's approach called for a system of quotas for world regions, which set at 3% the total population of the foreign-born of each nationality in the United States, as recorded in the 1910 census. This put the total number of visas available each year to new immigrants at 350,000. It did not, however, establish quotas of any kind for residents of the Western Hemisphere. President Wilson opposed the Restrictive Act, to his credit, preferring a more liberal immigration policy. So he used the pocket veto to prevent its passage. In early 1921, the newly inaugurated President Warren Harding called Congress back to a, to a special session to pass the law. And in 1922, the act was renewed for another two years. Coolidge agreed in principle with this approach. And I quote, I am convinced that our present economic and social conditions warrant a limitation of those to be admitted, unquote, he wrote. But he was not personally hostile to immigrants already in the United States. Indeed, he had won many of the offices he held up to the presidency uh, by courting the Irish and Italian immigrants who were swelling the, the ranks of the people of Massachusetts in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Coolidge was especially disquieted by the widely supported Japanese exclusion provision, which would completely forbid any immigration from Japan for the first time in US history. Coolidge's own words also demonstrate his personal affection for immigrants and the open, embracing manner in which he saw the issue. In his 1925 speech to the American Legion Convention out in Omaha, Nebraska, he said, whether one traces his Americanism back three centuries to the Mayflower or three years off the steerage is not half so important as whether his Americanism of today is real and genuine. No matter by what various crafts we came here, we are all now in the same boat." Unquote. Additionally, in his 1926 speech at the dedication of the statue of John Erickson in Washington, DC, he was a Swedish uh, guy who helped us in some way win the, the Civil War. And the Crown Prince of Sweden was present there as well. So the speech is actually mostly about how awesome Swedish people are. But at the beginning of it, he, he has some very moving words about uh, immigration. It is one of the glories of our country that we all have the privilege of being Americans. Some of us were born here of an ancestry that has lived here for generations. Others of us were born abroad and brought here at a tender age or have come to these shores as a result of mature choice. But when once our feet have touched this soil, when once we have made this land our home, wherever our place of birth, whatever our race, we are all blended in one common country. All artificial distinctions of lineage and rank are cast aside. We all rejoice in the title of Americans. But this is not done by discarding the teachings and beliefs or the character which have contributed to the strength and progress of the peoples from which our various strains derived their origin, but rather from the acceptance of all their good qualities and their adaptation to the requirements of our institutions. None of those who come here are required to leave any good qualities behind, but they are rather required to strengthen and fortify them and supplement them with such additional good qualities as they find among us. While it is eminently proper for us to glory in our origin and to cherish with pride the contributions which our race has made to the common progress of humanity, we cannot put too much emphasis on the fact that in this country we are all bound together in a common destiny. We must all be united as one people. This principle works both ways. As we do not recognize any inferior races, so we do not recognize any superior races. We all stand on an equality of rights and of opportunity, each deriving just honor from their own worth and accomplishments." Unquote. One of my favorite Coolidge quotes. This immigration tussle took place concurrently with Coolidge and Mellon's efforts to pass the 1924 Revenue Act, and the immigration bill enjoyed far more support than the Revenue Bill. Coolidge was deeply depressed by the details of the immigration legislation. When the congressional debate over immigration began in 1924, the quota system was so well established that no one questioned whether to maintain it, but rather discussed how to adjust it. Though there were advocates for raising quotas um, and allowing more people to enter, the champions of restriction triumphed. They created a plan that lowered the existing quota from 3 to 2% of the foreign-born population. 
they also pushed back the year on which the quota calculations were based from 1910 to 1890. Another change to the quota altered, altered the basis of the quota calculations. The quota had been based on the number of people born outside of the United States, or rather the number of immigrants currently within the United States. The new law traced the origins of the whole US population, including natural born citizens. So that necessarily meant that new quota calculations included large numbers of people of British descent whose families had long resided in the United States and there wasn't, there wasn't, many British, there wasn't much British um, immigration to the US in the early 1920s, or the early 1900s, I should say. Most of it came from Southern and Eastern Europe. As a result, the, presented, the percentage of visas available to individuals from the British Isles and Western Europe increased, but newer immigrants um, from other areas like Southern and, and Eastern Europe were limited. The 1924 Immigration Act also included a provision excluding from entry any alien who by virtue of race or nationality was ineligible for citizenship. Existing nationality laws dating from 1790 and 1870 excluded people, all people of Asian lineage from naturalizing. Coolidge supported slowing immigration for a while, but his concerns about the Japanese exclusion provision remained, and he worried that the Japanese government would respond unkindly. Um, I should note that Japan already greatly restricted immigration, that is, out-migration, from the country. Coolidge cared about the dignity of the immigration process. In January 1924, he and budget director Herbert Lord had unusually spent some extra cash when they ordered an appropriation of $300,000 to improve conditions in the detention quarters at Ellis Island, including adding new equipment for the nursery and kindergarten for, the for detainees, electric wiring for the station, and 350 new beds to replace the flimsy wire bottom cots that were in use at the time. On the 26th of May, 1924, after much agonizing deliberation, Coolidge put pen to paper and signed the Johnson-Reed Act, adding in a signing statement um, his own disdain for the Japanese exclusion provision. For years, the gentleman's agreement under which Japan herself had monitored and restricted out-migration um, from that country um, had allowed the Japanese to save face when it came to immigration, to pretend that, at least in migration policy, um, the emperor was the person who controlled what, what went on. Now Tokyo decided to withdraw its ambassador from the United States, and America's envoy to Japan, Cyrus Woods, also withdrew his commission, though on grounds of family illness. Coolidge warned that the historic relationship with Japan was now disturbed and unnecessarily so. The Japanese government protested, but the law remained, resulting in an increase in existing tensions between the two nations. Despite the increased tensions, it appeared that the US Congress had decided that reserving the racial composition of the country was more important than promoting good ties with Japan. From that unfortunate episode in the Coolidge presidency, we turn to a more felicitous legislative initiative, the passage of the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. Until the Indian Citizenship Act of 24, Indians occupied an unusual status under federal law. Some had acquired citizenship by marrying white men. Others received citizenship through military service by receipt of allotments um, or through special treaties or special statuses or statutes. But many were still not citizens and they were barred from the ordinary processes of naturalization open to foreigners. Congress took what some saw as the final step on the 2nd of June 1924 and granted citizenship to all Native Americans born in the United States. Granting citizenship was not a response to some universal petition by American Indian groups. Rather, it was a move by the federal government to absorb Indians into the mainstream of American life and have them assimilate. No doubt, Indian participation in the First World War accelerated granting citizenship to all Indians, but it seems more likely to have been the logical um, extension and culmination of the assimilation policy. After all, Native Americans had demonstrated their ability to assimilate into the general military society. There were no segregated Indian units, as there were for African Americans. Some whites declared that Indians had successfully passed the assimilation test during wartime, and thus they, they deserved the rewards of citizenship. So the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924 proclaimed, being enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled, that all non-citizen Indians born within the territorial limits of the United States be, and they are hereby declared to be citizens of the United States. 
provided that the granting of such citizenship shall not in any manner impair or otherwise affect the right of any Indian or, uh, to tribal or other property. Some other aspects of Coolidge's policies um, that were important include the Air Commerce Act of 1926, which regulated civil aviation and made possible the development of this new industry at the time, the Public Buildings Act of 1926, which authorized the start of construction on the magnificent Federal Triangle, complex of buildings in the nation's capital, and the Federal Radio Act of 1927, which put in place a regulatory framework for the new media under which it would thrive. Coolidge also was successful in blocking many of the initiatives he, he opposed, most notably the McNary Hogan Farm Relief Bill. Coolidge came from a family of farmers, and not terribly successful farmers at that. Plymouth Notch is a rocky, mountainous hamlet. It was once determined that there isn't a single acre of arable land in the entire village. <laughs> As a result, local farmers in Coolidge's time relied on livestock to make a living and engineered clever ways to bring their products to market. Like the Plymouth Notch Cheese Factory, still in operation today, I recommend all of you buy cheese. <laughs> Founded by John Coolidge and other farmers in 1890 to provide a vehicle for preserving uh, their cow milk. None of those farmers ever struck gold in their efforts, but they were usually able to sell their goods and avoid penury. When Coolidge entered the White House, he was keenly aware of the challenges and pitfalls of the agricultural lifestyle. The industry experienced rapid changes in the 1920s as improvements in technology increasingly mechanized agricultural labor. The disastrous effects of the Great War on Europe also helped American agriculture. Since European production was halted to such a degree that American agricultural products were in heavy demand in Europe and throughout the world. As worldwide demand increased, American farmers expanded their operations in the 19-teens to meet it. Once the war ended, European ag rebounded, which led to steep domestic uh, price declines here in America and a virtual depression for American farmers, even as the rest of the economy surged to untold heights. As the decade continued, farmers clamored for government subsidies. A farm relief bill was proposed, which would have allowed the, the feds to purchase excess agricultural supply and sell it off to foreign markets for reduced prices. The bill was supported by Agriculture Secretary Henry C. Wallace, the father of the Henry Wallace who served in the, as vice president in the Roosevelt administration. But a slight rebound in prices led to the bill's rejection by Congress just before the 1924 presidential election. In 1926, in the face of another price drop, Senator Charles McNary of Oregon and Representative Gilbert Hogan of Iowa proposed the McNary Hogan Farm Relief Bill which would have created a farm relief board to buy a surplus yield in good years and either sell it abroad or store it whenever possible for later use. Coolidge strongly opposed this legislation. It would only lead to further requests for subsidies when supply increased without a concomitant increase in demand. The bill passed Congress several times and he vetoed it each time. One might ask, why would Coolidge not look with compassion upon the suffering farmers and offer the helping hand of government in their hour of need. Quite simply, Coolidge understood the distorting effects of arbitrary government policy. In his 1928 veto message, he wrote, and I quote, we should avoid the error of seeking in laws the cause of the ills of agriculture. This mistake leads away from a permanent solution and serves only to make political issues out of fundamental economic problems that cannot be solved by political action, unquote. And in, in a more terse, variation of this, he said once, well, farmers never have made much money. <laughs> Coolidge's political modesty led him to the conclusion that in the realm of economics, it was best to allow consumers to determine the prices of goods, and thus allow producers the freedom to adjust their production levels to the amounts demanded by consumers. In his opinion, government had no special knowledge of either the discrete products demanded by consumers or the necessary quantities of those products that producers should demand, should, should produce. To inject government into the fray would have led to unhealthy consequences for the economy in Coolidge's view. Coolidge's small government philosophy was put to the ultimate test in April 1927, when the Mississippi River overflowed its banks. Since the previous fall, heavy rains followed by floods had wrought havoc in the Midwest. On April 16th, the disaster assumed new proportions 
when a 1,200-foot stretch of a levee collapsed in southern Illinois. Five days later, the force of the torrent broke another levee downriver at Mounds Landing, Mississippi. The water swept away hundreds of black laborers working to fortify the river banks. In the days ahead, the disaster would kill hundreds, displace hundreds of thousands, and produce damages totaling in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The day after the levee collapsed, Coolidge held a meeting of his cabinet. He chose Herbert Hoover, his Commerce Secretary, to head up a rescue and relief effort. Hoover was Coolidge's stylistic and temperamental opposite. When the president liked to, where the president liked to delegate work and didn't care much for the minutia of policy, Hoover was a workaholic, technocrat, hands-on manager. And as a Stanford-trained engineer who had led flood, uh, food relief efforts after the First World War in Europe, was an obvious choice for the job. Hoover threw himself into this task readily. During the three months from April through July 1927, Hoover wielded enormous administrative and political power as the public face of disaster response, relief, and reconstruction. While Hoover made some glaring errors that foreshadowed his later mismanagement of the nation's economy as president and his general resistance to advice, the general consensus is that the commission facilitated the quick and efficient utilization and coordination of governmental and private sector resources. However, public debate swirled around the strong response from the government in Washington in both dollars and symbolism. Coolidge resisted both. Governors, senators, and mayors asked him to visit the flood zone. Your coming would center eyes of nation, and the consequent publicity would result in securing millions of dollars additional aid for sufferers, the governor of Mississippi wrote in a telegram. But Coolidge demurred. He declined requests from NBC to broadcast a nationwide radio appeal, and from humorist Will Rogers to send a telegram to be read at a benefit. Taking center stage, Coolidge feared, would feed demands for a greater federal role in dealing with the calamity. Four decades earlier, Grover Cleveland had vetoed a relief bill for Texas drought victims, and even Theodore Roosevelt, who did as much as anyone to expand the presidency's role in solving national problems, had demanded that local New Orleans banks underwrite federal funds being spent to fight yellow fever there. For Coolidge to break with this tradition might set a dangerous precedent, and he knew might imperil the budget surpluses he had worked so hard to achieve. But the public, especially down in the distressed areas, called on Washington to do more. It has been necessary, wrote the Jackson, Mississippi Clarion Ledger, to school President Coolidge day by day a bit more towards the realization of the immensity of the catastrophe. Urging the president to use the surplus for relief the Paducah, Kentucky News Democrat concluded that Coolidge had either, quote, the coldest heart in America or the dullest imagination, and we were about ready to believe he has both, unquote. Still, others supported the president. And I quote, fortunately, there are still some things that can be done without the wisdom of Congress and the all-fathering federal government, said the New York Times. Unremitting newspaper coverage of the suffering wrought by the flood increased the pressure. But Congress had adjourned, and Coolidge declined to convene a special session to pass an emergency appropriation. Only in late 1927, when Illinois' Frank Reed, the Republican chair of the House Flood Control Committee, held public hearings, was Coolidge's hand forced. In his December 1927 State of the Union message, they were often done in December back then, um, he endorsed federal flood control measures but he insisted that local governments and property owners bear most of the cost. And I quote from that message, the government is not the insurer of its citizens against the hazards of the elements, Coolidge said. We shall always have flood and drought, heat and cold, earthquake and wind, lightning and tidal wave, which are all too constant in their afflictions. The government does not undertake to reimburse citizens for the loss and damage incurred under such circumstances. It is chargeable, however, with the rebuilding of public works and the humanitarian duty of, of relieving its citizens of distress." Unquote. Coolidge's plan also called for spending hundreds of millions of dollars less than the Senate and the House bills. Deadlock ensued. Will Rogers remarked that Coolidge was going to further postpone relief legislation in, quote, the hope 
that those needing relief will perhaps have conveniently died in the meantime. Unquote. <laughs> Eventually, Coolidge conceded on the issue of local contributions, but only partially. To avoid assuming too large a permanent role for Washington, he specified that only areas flooded in 1927 could depend on more federal aid and less local aid. But Congress thought little of this overture, and Coolidge grew intransigent about yielding any more. In April, the president told an aide that he considered the emerging legislation, quote, the most radical and dangerous bill that he has had the countenance of the Congress um, since I have been president, unquote. Coolidge had his reasons. He told reporters he feared the Congress had lost sight of the goal of protecting those threatened by floods. And I quote, it has become a scramble to take care of the railroads and the banks and the individuals who have invested in the levy bonds and the great lumber concerns that own many thousands of acres in that locality with wonderful prospects for the contractors, unquote. He also thought that the appropriation was being larded up with giveaways and that Southern corruption would prevent the funds from reaching their beneficiaries. In early May, with the House and Senate trying to reconcile their versions of the bill, Coolidge finally stepped in to strike a deal. To his, satis his satisfaction, it stipulated that Washington would be financially responsible only for the areas flooded in 1927, but it also allowed that the cash-strapped localities wouldn't have to contribute and thus spent more federal dollars than the president had wanted. It also established a federal board to improve the physical engineering around the river. And notably, it deemed the region's flooding to be a matter of national concern. Declaring the measure, quote, the best that can be obtained from Congress, unquote, Coolidge accepted it, though he declined to host a signing ceremony, inking the bill in private on the 15th of May, just after finishing his lunch. The bill was not what Coolidge wanted, but it at least cost, at least the cost had been marked down to $500 million. The Army Corps of Engineers was clearly vested with responsibility for all flood control projects and a provision was made for local contributions. Having fought the good fight, Coolidge decided to sign the bill, not least because it was the politically feasible thing to do in the 1928 election year. <laughs> Despite the president's reluctance, the 1928 bill was a landmark. Not only did it provide needed aid, but as Coolidge had feared, it overturned the expectation that Washington could leave, leave regional crises to state local governments. Soon, under Franklin D. Roosevelt and the New Deal, the public would come to rely on a vigorous role for Washington in disaster relief, as in so many other areas, uh, through programs like the Tennessee Valley Authority Act um, and the Soil Conservation Service. And it must be recorded that there were also several instances of Coolidge-supported initiatives that went absolutely nowhere in Congress. These included legislation addressing railroad consolidation, government reorganization, and an anti-lynching measure. In all, Coolidge vetoed 20 bills and pocket vetoed another 30. Only four of his regular vetoes were overridden, but among them was the popular and costly Soldier's Bonus Bill. Here, Coolidge put himself in opposition to the Congress and their constituents, especially veterans, and he lost. But the people seemed to admire him for having the courage of his convictions, and to lessen criticism, he acted promptly to implement the legislation. To build public support for his program of constructive economy, as he referred to it, he cleverly made pioneering use of the new medium of radio, reporting semi-annually to the public on the budget and tax matters. The radio permitted him to speak directly to the American people over the heads of politicians and newspaper editors. It helped him to block or lessen raids on the Treasury, such as those attempted by Congress in connection with the Mississippi River flood um, improvements. To improve his effectiveness over the air, he brought in an expert to work with him on his radio presence. Through his extensive use of airwaves, he made over 50 major radio addresses. Coolidge became America's first radio president. Coolidge, of course, did not neglect the print media, it being a great source of free publicity. As president, he went out of his way to accommodate the needs of the White House press corps. For instance, he provided them with stories on slow news days, and most notably, he became the first president to hold regular, twice-weekly press conferences. He thus got along well with most newsmen, and in turn, he received generally favorable coverage in the pages of the nation's newspapers. He also willingly satisfied the demands of camera and newsreel men, who had only recently gained access to the White House. All he asked of them was not to take his picture, 
while he was savoring one of his favorite, uh, his, uh, favorite cigars. It is worth noting that during the 1924 campaign, he became the first president to appear in a talking newsreel, which you can actually view on YouTube. I can't believe that, you know, I can imagine President Coolidge seeing himself on YouTube, but he's on YouTube, so you go on YouTube, you can find him. He also, uh, I'm sorry, Coolidge was uh, not, also not an, an isolationist. He understood early on the new heightened status of the United States among the nations of the world. Speaking at Tremont Temple on November 2nd, 1918, only a few days before the armistice, Governor Coolidge said this, we have taken a new place among the nations. The revolution made us a nation. The Spanish-American War made us a world power. The present war has given us recognition as a world power. We shall not again be considered provincial. Whether we desired it or not, this position has come to us with its duties and its responsibilities. On the international front, the Coolidge administration supported the Dawes Plan for German reparations and established accommodative payment schedules for Allied war debt to the United States. This, along with American private loans and governmental support, gradually led the major nations of the world to restore the international gold standards, thereby spurring world trade. President Coolidge and his Secretary of State, Frank B. Kellogg, made the pursuit of world peace a cornerstone of their international diplomacy. Like most of their fellow countrymen, they saw the effects of the Great War, that the Great War had on millions of people um, impacted by it, whether they were returning soldiers or the families of the fallen warriors. They also saw the deleterious results of that catastrophic conflict for the world order. No war in human history had ever led to such astounding carnage. Coolidge and Kellogg's efforts to avert another conflagration on the scale of the 1914 to 1918 war were in keeping with their heartfelt humanitarian desire to see mankind beat its swords into plowshares and walk a path of amity henceforth and forevermore. With the influence and assistance of peace advocates Nicholas Murray Butler and James T. Shotwell of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, French Foreign Minister Aristide Briand proposed a peace pact as a bilateral agreement between the United States and France to outlaw war between the two nations. Particularly hard hit by the Great War, France faced continuing insecurity from its German neighbor and sought alliances to shore up its defenses. Briand published an open letter in April 1927 containing the proposal. Though the suggestion had the enthusiastic support of some members of the American peace movement, US President Calvin Coolidge and Secretary of State Kellogg were less eager than Briand to enter into a bilateral agreement. They worried that the agreement um, against war could be interpreted as a bilateral alliance and require the United States to intervene if France was ever threatened. To avoid this, they suggested that the two nations take the lead in inviting all nations to join them in outlawing war. The extension, the extension of the pact to include other nations was well received internationally. After the severe losses of the First World War, the idea of declaring war to be illegal was immensely popular in international public opinion. Because the language of the pact established the important point that only wars of aggression, not military acts of self-defense, would be covered under the pact, many nations had no objections to signing it. If the pact served to limit conflicts, then everyone would benefit. If it did not, there were no legal consequences. In early 1928, negotiations over the agreement expanded to include all of the initial signatories. In the final version of the pact, they agreed upon two clauses. The first outlawed war as an instrument of national policy, and the second called upon signatories to settle their, their disputes by peaceful means. On the 27th of August, 1928, 15 nations signed the pact at Paris. Signatories included France, the United States, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, Belgium, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Germany, Italy, and Japan. Later, an additional 47 nations followed suit. So the pact was eventually signed by most of the established nations in the world. The US Senate ratified the agreement by a vote of 85 to 1, though it did so only after making reservations to note that US participation did not limit the right to self-defense or require it to act against signatories breaking the agreement. When President Coolidge put pen to paper to sign this treaty, he committed the United States to refrain from using war to resolve, quote, 
disputes or conflicts over, of whatever nature or of whatever origin there may be which may arise among them." Unquote. In the nearly nine decades since, historians and others have debated the utility of this treaty, since, as we know, it, did not, it was not effective in preventing the multitude of conflicts that followed it, including the Second World War. Despite this fact, it is important to acknowledge that the pact, which remains in force to this day, established the principle that the threat or use of military force in, contra in contravention of international law, as well as the territorial acquisitions resulting therefrom, are illegitimate and unlawful. Many of the treaty's provisions were also incorporated into the United Nations Charter in the mid-1940s. Also notable, the administration, through the good work of Ambassador Dwight W. Morrow, did succeed in restoring our strained relationship with Mexico at a time when some were pressing for intervention in that unhappy country. As president, Coolidge did venture outside of the United States on one occasion. This was in January of 1928, when he journeyed to Havana, Cuba, to speak to the Sixth International Conference of American States. In the late 1890s, American foreign policy was mobilized to pressure Spain into relinquishing control of Cuba, which eventually led to the Spanish-American War. That conflict ended with America directly influencing much of the former Spanish Empire, which included nations such as the Philippines, Guam, um, Cuba, of course, and Puerto Rico. The Platt Amendment, which governed our policy towards Cuba for much of the first half of, half of the 20th century, gave the United States the authority to unilaterally intervene in Cuban, Cuban domestic affairs. And incidentally, the Platt Amendment also forms the basis for our continued lease of the Guantanamo Bay Naval Base. This policy continued through the years of the Coolidge presidency. The influence of the United States was felt throughout Latin America in the 1920s, with billions of dollars of American investments deeply tying the economies of many South and Central American countries to the United States. America also controlled the Panama Canal and was deeply involved in shaping internal Cuban affairs. It was against this backdrop that President Coolidge boarded the battleship USS Texas in January 1928 en route to Havana. Coolidge undertook this singular visit abroad to assuage the feelings of bitterness that existed between America and the Spanish-speaking nations of the Western Hemisphere. Coolidge biographer Amity Schley is also my boss paints a vivid portrait of the president's entry into the Cuban capital, writing that, and I quote, thousands climbed onto the Moro Castle and the rooftops of buildings, craning their necks to get a glimpse of the battleship USS Texas as it moved into the harbor, unquote. Coolidge remains to this day the only American president to set foot on Cuban soil while in office. President Coolidge opened the Pan American Conference with a keynote speech that urged the nations of the Western Hemisphere to embrace peace and value the principles of freedom and democracy. The title had come, or I'm sorry, the time had come to beat our swords into plowshares, the president said. He also emphasized the equality that existed between quote, the smallest and the weakest to speak here with the same authority as the largest and the most powerful, unquote. He remarked, you are continuing to strike a new note in international gatherings by maintaining a forum in which not the selfish interests of a few, but the general welfare of all will be considered." Unquote. These remarks presaged the Coolidge administration's efforts to ensure peace and concord among the nations with the Kellogg-Briand Pact. It also nudged the United States in the direction that would culminate in uh, 1933 with President Franklin Roosevelt's good neighbor policy of non-intervention in Latin America. Coolidge's interest in military affairs dated to 1899, when, as a city councilman, he proposed to secure an armory for Northampton, Massachusetts. It was revived again during the Great War, at the time he was serving in the state government. Indeed, his first act as governor was to approve funding for a welcoming celebration for the men of the Yankee, Divi Yankee Division coming back from the First World War. As president, Coolidge sought to maintain a modest military force sufficient to meet peacetime demands. His guiding principles were, as he described them, preparation, limitation, and renunciation. This policy, is worth, it is worth recalling, was well suited for a time when anti-war sentiment was very strong. Not all was peaceful within the military itself, however. Controversy raged around Colonel William Billy Mitchell, a proponent of what, was, what were then advanced but controversial ideas about military aviation. Lacking restraint, Mitchell attacked the military establishment for being hidebound 
going so far as to accuse its leaders of an almost treasonable administration of the nation's defense, as he put it. This could not go on. Eventually, at the direct order of President Coolidge, Mitchell was court-martialed for insubordination. Having been found guilty, he resigned from the Army. Coolidge was the last president never to have flown in an airplane, yet he well understood the value of aviation and supported its development. The greatest public moment of Coolidge's presidency, as well as a high watermark of the 1920s, was the welcoming home ceremony at Washington for Charles Lindbergh on the 11th of June, 1927. It took place following the Lone Eagle's solo flight in the Spirit of St. Louis aircraft from New York to Paris, in which the young brave pilot had triumphed over death. Thanks to radio, Americans in cities and in towns and on the farms across the nation were also able to participate in this wonderful national celebration. With the backing of the Coolidge administration, Lindbergh, who the president raised to the rank of colonel, went on uh, to tour the nation and build public support for aviation. Later, as America's winged ambassador, he made a goodwill tour of Latin America, being greeted along the way by large enthusiastic crowds. Lindbergh and Coolidge developed a lasting relationship. Military training was also encouraged. Coolidge's son John was attending a citizen's military training camp in 1923 when his father became president. It was Coolidge's thinking that the national debt was the weakest link, link in the nation's defense because it reduced the funds available to meet military needs in a crisis. Thus, his debt reduction program was fundamental to strengthen, strengthening the nation's military footing. He understood, moreover, that the greatest strength of the country rested ultimately not on its implements of war, but on its people, its agriculture, and industrial resources, and its wealth. This led him to focus primarily on issues relating to the mobilization of manpower and, and industry. In this matter, he called for advice upon Bernard M. Baruch, who had headed the War Industries Board in the Great War, to address the problems of war profiteering and war fortunes that had so angered the public. He urged the drafting not, not just of not just men, but also wealth and resources in the event of a future war. Sacrifice would be required of all, and no war profits would be allowed. Coolidge did not forget the veterans and their families. As governor and president, he supported programs for veterans, especially those aimed at the disabled. The, no the one notable exception was his opposition to the World War I Soldier's Bonus Bill, which was finally passed over his veto in 1924. Besides threatening the country's finances at a critical point, he believed this bill, with its money handouts, would diminish the value of the veteran's service to their nation. No person, he firmly noted, was ever honored for what he received. Honor has been the reward for what he gave. He gave. As president, he and Mrs. Coolidge held receptions on the White House lawn at which they welcomed and entertained wounded veterans from area hospitals. Coolidge famously summed up his feelings for veterans in these words. The nation that forgets its, def its defenders will itself be forgotten. He was also an enthusiastic supporter of the American Legion, which he viewed as an, a unifying patriotic force in American life, speaking before its national convention as vice president in 1921 and as president in 1925. One of the highlights of his presidency was his dedication of the World War I Liberty Memorial in Kansas City on Armistice Day, November 11, 1926, an event that was broadcast nationally. The Coolidge presidency, 1923 to 1929, was a most successful one. That certainly was the overwhelming judgment of most of his contemporaries. The president was fortunate to preside over what was probably the most exciting, vital, creative decade of the, ninth, of the 20th century. It was a decade of youth. It was a decade when modern America came alive. Not all was perfect by any means. There were pockets of unemployment, the farmers were hard pressed, and most disturbingly, intolerance manifested itself in the form of the Ku Klux Klan. Yet, it was overall an era marked by peace and unprecedented prosperity. Most Americans had never had it so good. And some would later argue that it was, last, it was the last time the American people were truly free. Coolidge enjoyed a widespread popularity and could easily have won re-election in, in 1928. Instead, he chose not to run again. Personal factors played a role in this decision, as well as the realization that his work was done and that the public was ready for a new man with a new approach. He remarked to a cabinet member, I know how to save money. All my training has been in that direction. The country is in a sound financial condition. 
Perhaps the time has come when we ought to spend money. I do not feel I am qualified to do that. <laughs> Moreover, as he wisely observed, it is a pretty good idea to get out when they still want you. <laughs> On the 4th of March, 1929, Calvin Coolidge departed Washington to the plaudits of the public for a job well done. When a reporter asked him what he considered his most important accomplishment, he replied simply, minding my own business. <laughs> he returned to Northampton, Massachusetts, there to live out the brief time remaining to him. He took up the pen, writing his autobiography, contributing to periodicals, and doing a syndicated newspaper column entitled Calvin Coolidge Says. He became a director of the New York Life Insurance Company, and at President Coolidge's request, or President Hoover's request, served on the National Transportation Committee, um, both transportation and insurance being subjects that, that had long interested him. He and Mrs. Coolidge traveled about the country. He dined with Huey Long, the infamous governor of Louisiana. He dedicated an Arizona dam named in his honor, which I visited last October. And even visited Hollywood and stayed at William Randolph Hearst's San Simeon estate. He withdrew from active politics, limiting himself to a few political addresses on behalf of the beleaguered Hoover administration. His final public address was um, in the fall of 1932 in support of Herbert Hoover's reelection. His health was not good, and worries over the ever deepening depression definitely preyed upon him. Death came in the form of a heart attack on the 5th of January, 1933. The president was 60 years old. He never lived to see the coming of the New Deal, but he rests today among his ancestors in the cemetery at Plymouth Notch, and he's remembered as a man of noble character, and that, no doubt, would please him greatly. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. In Bill Bryson's uh, summer of 1927 book, he makes a big deal about uh, uh, Coolidge leaving for three month, on a three month vacation mm -hmm. in the middle of uh, the summer. And when you place that with the, uh, the flooding that had gone on and the other things happening, I'm pretty brave <laughs> just to go to Montana for three months. Well, uh, uh, South Dakota. South Dakota. Yeah, well, this was summer of 1927. Um, the official excuse that was given was that it, it was very hot in D.C. D.C.'s building a swamp, so um, he wanted to go on vacation. He went on vacation every summer, he and Grace, to different places. One summer he went to Wisconsin, another summer he went up to Saranac Lake in the Adirondacks. Um, summer of 24, he was in Plymouth. Uh, but in 27, the people of South Dakota <coughs> went on a blitz to, get him, to convince him to come to South Dakota for the summer. So he was convinced, and in June 27, he and Grace and the whole White House apparatus packed up and went out to, to the Badlands of South Dakota. And um, this summer was, they loved it so much, they only intended to stay for a few weeks, but they ended up staying for a whole three months. Um, and this summer, several very key things happened. Um, he dedicated the Mount Rushmore site, Mount um, Gutson Borblum, the architect convinced him to come break away from his vacation and dedicate the site there. Um, and he was also inaugurated as a member of the Sioux Indian tribe while he was out in South Dakota. Um, and there are newsreel images of him wearing this beautiful Indian headdress that you can see, actually I just saw it a few weeks ago, down in Northampton, Massachusetts at the Forbes Library where most of his papers are. And that headdress is there as well. And his Indian name uh, was Chief Leading Eagle <laughs> as President of the United States. He was the Leading Eagle. Uh, so yes, that was a that was a very important summer um, in the Coolidge's life. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. With all of these accomplishments and quotations and policies and things, where did he get the uh, nickname of Simon Cow? Well, um, that nickname comes from the fact that President Coolidge was very laconic in personal conversation. He was not a. It, it, it's kind of interesting that this person who's very reserved and um, not a backslapping, you know, I compared him to Joe Biden earlier. He's like the complete opposite of backslapping Joe Biden. Uh, but he managed to win all these offices and whatnot, from city council all the way to the president. But yeah, he was he was very laconic in his personal conversation. He just didn't think that if you if you had something important to say, you'd say it, but if not, then you don't just go on words. But his son, um, John Coolidge, 
remarked once that when you got him talking on certain subjects, he could be, you know, he could hardly shut him up. Um, and of course, when it comes to what I think is one of his greatest legacies or his speeches, um, he was just eloquent in some of the things that he says. Whether you agree with his political philosophy or not, the best way to learn about what he believed was to read his speeches, particularly speeches like Have Faith in Massachusetts, which was the speech he gave in 1914, January 7th of that year when he was first inaugurated as president of the Massachusetts Senate, um, his first State of the Union address, his 1925 inauguration speech, um, the speech he gave in the White House August of 24 to the newsreel cameras, which was excerpts from his acceptance speech um, at the Republican convention in 24. I mean, there's all sorts of speeches that you can read in Coolidge's that, and the speeches that I quoted from about immigration, uh, the, the Omaha speech and the John Erickson speech, where he's just absolutely eloquent um, in, in what he says. So I think that Silent Cal is um, the moniker that he's been given because of his laconic nature in personal speech, but when it came to important policy issues and, and his political philosophy and that sort of thing, he was absolutely eloquent. I've, re I've read that he that he wrote, researched and wrote his own speeches. What does your yes. research show? Yes, he did. He, he, he had very little help from most of his speeches. Um, of course, when you're in the White House, you have all sorts of assistants and whatnot to help you with some things. But he did he did write most most all of his speeches. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. After he left office a year or two later, there was the huge debacle of the stock market crash. Mm -hmm. Do you think that any of the policies that he put into his administration contributed to that? That's a that's a huge question, and it's one that um, really colors a lot of people's perspectives on President Coolidge. Um, as, as you note from the, this, my, my remarks and whatnot, President Coolidge is not a believer in the intervention of the federal government. He was a hands-off kind of a guy. He wanted taxes low, regulations light, the government to get out of the way and just let people be free, essentially. Um, and then I also mentioned his, his successor and his commerce secretary, Herbert Hoover, who was president when the stock market crashed. Um, and Hoover is often given the, has, has often had the reputation of being just another Coolidge in that respect, being this very sort of hands-off type of guy. But if you think about it, that was not at all in keeping with his character. Hoover was uh, a, a Stanford-trained mining engineer. He was one of the most well-paid men of his generation. He had um, pioneered in, in the food relief of Europe after the First World War and became Commerce Secretary and was just involved in everything. You know, Commerce was his bailiwick, but he, was, he had a hand in every other bailiwick in the federal government um, throughout the 1920s as well. Coolidge once remarked that um, <laughs> he called him Wonder Boy and said that that man has given me lots of advice over the course of my career. All but bad. Coolidge is not a fan of her. Um, but, so, so Hoover, I think you have to look at, when it comes to the Great Depression and the, particularly the stock market crash of 29, um, the things that contribute to such an event are important, definitely. The, the, the speculation that was going on, that sort of thing. But the response is also just as important. There are things that you can do to make a depression or, or an economic downturn light and, and last a very brief period of time, or there are things that you can do to exacerbate such a crisis. Um, and this is a, an issue that economists and historians dispute like crazy. Um, my boss, Amity Schles, who is the chairman and CEO of the Coolidge Foundation, um, is a, an economist and historian who argues from her book, The Forgotten Man, that it was Hoover's policies of action, government action and regulation and raising tax rates and all that sort of thing, and then that which were put into high gear when Roosevelt became president is what made the Great Depression great because businesses had uncertainty and they wouldn't hire in, in that environment. I mean, the, the Roosevelt administration made dumping on business a professional activity through the 1930s. And, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for that argument. It's not the orthodox that we're taught in school these days, as I know, because I was in school just a few years ago. But, um, but when you think about it, if you look at the history of economic downturns in the history of the United States, we've never had, in the whole history of our country, 
an economic downturn that was as deep or as long lasting as the Great Depression. In fact, when Hoover, or when um, Harding and Coolidge came into the White House in the, the spring of 21, we were in the depths of a depression at that time. But the reason no one, who, raise your hands if you, knew, if you knew there was a depression from 20 to 21 in the United States, that in many respects was worse than what happened in the, in the 30s. Hardly, no one, not a single person in this room knows about that. And the reason is, it didn't last a whole decade. <laughs> um, it lasted for about a year and a half, and the policy approach that actually both Wilson and Harding took to it was to ignore it. They cut taxes, they reduced regulations, they reduced the size of the federal government. The depression was over by the end of 1921. Mm -hmm. And that's the and, and the, the depression of uh, the late 20s and through the 1930s, in which we had double-digit unemployment for the entire decade of the 1930s. Not a single month of the entire decade did unemployment rise above or below double or, or drop below double digits. That, I mean, as I said, we've never had anything like that in our history. The only difference is that the government tried to solve the 30s depression, whereas all the depressions that had taken place before, it didn't try to solve. But that is a that's, the, that's my belief about the depression. But you know, many other people will have um, they think Roosevelt was the savior of our country during the depression, and that's that's fine. You know, there's plenty of economists and historians who will back up that belief, but I think when you look at the data, it, you know, how do you argue with 10 straight years of double-digit unemployment? But anyways, yes, ma'am? You sound like a true believer. Were you a true believer before you came to work for the <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not, I'm not entirely a true believer. Uh, I am personally much more libertarian than President Coolidge. For instance, I mentioned um, in discussing the immigration policies, I think that Hour, President Coolidge not standing up to the xenophobes in Congress in, 1920, in 1924 was one of his worst moves as president. Because um, that Immigration Act completely cut off all immigration from, you know, I mean, we had hardly any immigration for the next 40, 50 years. Um, and, you know, you can, you can, you can um, attribute that to the Depression. People aren't going to be immigrating during the Depression um, and then the war, of course. But, but still, I just think it's, it's unconscionable that you just completely disallow anyone who's Asian from becoming a US citizen. I think that's awful. Um, but, and I wish President Cole would just sit up. Um, but, but you know, I am definitely a true believer. And I believed in President Coolidge um, before I came to the Coolidge Foundation. And that's actually how I ended up at the Coolidge Foundation. Um, I, I ran into our chairman, Amy Schlaes, and she heard how much I loved Coolidge and offered me a job, essentially. <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, to go back to the police strike in mm -hmm. Boston, um, there's a fictional book that I read a, a while ago called, uh, written by Dennis Lehane, called The Given Day. And I believe mm -hmm. it has to do with the, the police strike in Boston. Have, have you read the book? I have. Yeah. Well, I think I'm right. I don't know if anyone here has read the book. But the policemen in Boston really had a tough time back then. Oh, absolutely. They didn't have any money. They had to buy their own uniform. Right, exactly. Buy their own clothes. <laughs> yes, they, they did. There have been, um, been inflation as well since, I mean, I think their last pay raise was in 1890 or something. So their wages grew less in real terms than they actually got. You know, it was a dreadful situation in Boston. Well, it's a good book to read. It's fiction. Very good. It's yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Uh, your remark about being laconic, uh, Dorothy Parker, who quite a bit said, you know the story? She, uh, someone said, we're going through the president has died. And she turned to them and said, how could you tell? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. My, my question is, <clears throat> prohibition was a total debacle and lasted about 13 years, I think. Mm -hmm. Was he aware that this was going to arrive and it something not to have been done about it? Or did he ever comment on it or make any suggestions? Well, President Coolidge was a rule of law kind of a guy. He was not a uh, teetotaler himself. He, he didn't think that there was anything morally wrong with drinking alcohol, but he believed in the rule of law. And if the Constitution said that it was illegal to um, drink alcohol, that's what he would enforce. And Mellon, through the Treasury Department, enforced prohibition as well. And it's interesting, when he went to Cuba, actually, which was a, <laughs> it was a fun song um, that, I mean, if, if you're interested, I can play it for you afterwards. It's on my phone. Um, I'll see you in CUBA. Um, that was from the 20s that talks about all of these people of means 
who would escape down to Cuba to get their alcohol <laughs> in the 20s. Um, but, but even when President Coolidge and, and Mrs. Coolidge went to Cuba in 1928, they were offered wine by the president of Cuba, and they refused it. Um, you know, because prohibition was on in the United States. So they were, that's, that's just the, the sentiment that they had. But um, I don't think President Coolidge would have supported it. He was a Congregationalist, um, and religiously speaking, you know, prohibition was a very religious-based thing. But um, he, he just was not a teetotaler at all. He, he didn't think that prohibition was necessary, but he enforced the law. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure whether this is a cool, but somebody said next to Coolidge, he said, I bet I can make you say more than two words. He said, you lose. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's probably, that's another famous anecdote. Yeah. Um, and we're not sure whether, actually we're not even sure whether or not this story is apocryphal, but it's been told so many times that um, one may think that it's probably real. But this is why I was vice president, actually. And as vice president, he, he and Grace were living in the Willard Hotel, which is down the road from the White House. There was no vice presidential residence in those days. So, you know, they had to eat somewhere. So. Coolidge, who was not a big social guy at all, but he went to all these parties because you had to eat somewhere. That's, that's the response he said. You gotta eat somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So um, there he was at a dinner party once while I was vice president, and the lady seated next to him said, Mr. Vice President, I made a bet with someone that I could get you to say more than two words at this party tonight. And Coolidge turned to her and said, you lose. And then there's a pause, and they both laugh. You know, I mean, it, it, it's a sort of, Dry humor that yeah. Coolidge was just, you know, that was him totally. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's one of the the main stories that people like to tell about Coolidge yeah. to demonstrate his yeah. his terse nature. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one more was shot. It's written here and there that his mother-in-law didn't want Grace to marry him. What do you know about that? That is absolutely true. Whoa. Um, she <laughs> well uh, in the in it was in 1904 they were married in um, October of 1904, which was a lot later than Calvin wanted. Calvin had met Grace Anna Goodhue. Let's talk about, a little bit about Grace for one. Grace was born in 1879 um, in Burlington, Vermont, the only Vermont First Lady. And she was raised in Burlington. Um, and she attended the University of Vermont, graduated in 1901, and then moved down to Northampton, Massachusetts to take a job at the Clark School for the Deaf as a teacher of the deaf. And so she was boarding at Clark School and, and Calvin was also living at the school in, the, in a men's dormitory. He was up in his room shaving one morning. Grace was downstairs outside. She saw him shaving and she burst out laughing because she thought it was really funny for some reason. <laughs> and Calvin was like, who is this lady laughing at me? <laughs> so then later they meet and they hit it off and he decides that he wants to marry her. Well, Grace's mother, Lamira Goodhue, um, takes a look at Calvin and says, I don't think I want you to marry this guy. <laughs> so Calvin's, you know, he's already proposed to Grace, gotten the consent of Grace's father, Andrew Good Goodhue, and it's her mother that just keeps postponing, why don't you wait until you know how to bake bread, she says to Grace. And Calvin responds, we can buy bread, you know? <laughs> So after all this, all this delay, now they're finally married in October of 1904. Uh, and Lamira lives until uh, towards the tail end of Coolidge's pregnancy in 1928. But they never were, you know, close, close to one another. <laughs> <laughs> Even after he became president of the United States, she was still kind of optional about that Coolidge guy. <laughs> But yes, and Grace, you know, Grace was um, the, the, the woman behind the throne, I suppose, because she was, for, you know, as, as straightforward and terse as, as Calvin, and buttoned up as Calvin was, she was this light and, and um, enthusiastic and bubbly, wonderful woman uh, that everyone loved. John Coolidge, their son, said that I'd never heard a person say a, a crossword about my mother. And um, the people of the United States loved her when she was first lady. During the, the years when Calvin was in politics in Massachusetts, there wasn't really a role for his wife um, in those days because they lived in Northampton, Massachusetts, in Western Mass, 
there was no governor's residence or anything while Grace was first lady of Massachusetts. So they were back home in the duplex that they lived in on Massasoit Street in Northampton, Massachusetts. Now, um, think back to Henry Cabot Lodge. You have a guy living, renting, renting, heaven forbid, <laughs> renting a duplex, Stop. <laughs> a two-person home, <laughs> governor of Massachusetts. <laughs> Um, and so they actually, they didn't own a home until after Calvin left the White House. They, they lived in, in the Massasoit Street House until 1929, 1930, when they built the Beaches, which is a home, um, a beautiful home, across, the, across town in Northampton on the Connecticut River, where they lived until Calvin died in 1933. Um, and actually, during the Boston police strike, the, um, the state police uh, guarded Grace and boys at the home in, in Northampton because they were afraid that uh, there might be trouble for the First Lady and her, her children. Uh, so that's, and then once, once Grace became Second Lady in 1921 and then First Lady in 1923, she sort of blossomed and was the, the social grace of D.C. Uh, and I encourage you, while we still have time, the historic site closes mid-October, but you can go over to Plymouth Notch and see some of Mrs. Coolidge's couture gowns that the state of Vermont has on display. Um, that, you know, Grace, Calvin Coolidge was a very parsimonious person when it came to money. He didn't like to spend and, you know, he was very sort of tight-wadded. But when it came to his wife, Grace's clothing, all bets were off. <laughs> he spent freely on Grace, very freely. Um, she was the most beautiful woman, well-dressed woman in Washington, D.C. So. That was his one weakness was, and she, he'd actually come home went from window shopping with hats and things that to, for Grace to wear. Um, then she would, you know, she'd wear them out of obligation. Sometimes they weren't like her style and whatnot, but, but she wore them because she loved Calvin. Uh, and it was not an easy marriage. Grace referred to her marriage to Calvin Coolidge as a double harness. Um, because, you know, he was, not a, he was not a warm guy. He just wasn't. He, he just wasn't a warm guy. Um, and he could be very difficult. There was a Secret Service agent that had become kind of close to Grace in 1927, 28. Um, good friends, never anything untoward. But Calvin had him dismissed because he didn't like, you know, that she was becoming so friendly with, with the Secret Service agent. Um, and it's interesting after after Grace or after Calvin died in 1933, Grace kind of blossomed on her own. She lived until 1957, and um, she died at the age of 77 or 78, I believe. And uh, she moved to a, a big new house called Road Forks in Northampton, and she toured Europe in, in the mid-1930s, and uh, she was involved with the war relief efforts in, in Northampton in the 40s. She relished her granddaughters during those years, and she um, kept the Coolidge homestead in Plymouth until the mid-1950s after she died, it was given to the state of Vermont for historic preservation purposes, which is the reason why the President Calvin Coolidge State Historic Site exists to this day. So we, we owe a lot to Mrs. Coolidge. Well, thank you yes, very much. Well, there's one, one more question. This hand has been up for a while. Could you say yeah. a few uh, words about the sad death of his son? Oh, sure. How that, how that affected his presidency and his site? Even? Absolutely. I didn't mention Calvin Jr. So um, in the summer of 1924, his second son, Calvin Coolidge Jr., was um, playing tennis on the lawn of the White House with uh, a couple of other people. He wasn't wearing socks, and he got a blister that went septic and had blood poisoning, and he died within a week. The, the, the tennis match took place, I think, June 28th, and he was dead by July 7th. This was July 7th, 1924, right before the 24 election. Uh, President Coolidge and the family, the whole family were just heartbroken. John Coolidge, the son who survived, who actually lived into his 90s, he, he died only in 2000, um, he said that that was the only time in his entire life he saw his father cry when, when Calvin Jr. was um, laid out in the White House. And President Coolidge writes in his autobiography that when Calvin Jr. died, um, the power and glory of the presidency went along with him. So it was a very, very, and then um, Mrs. Coolidge wrote this beautiful poem called The Open Door um, that I don't have quoted here, but you can go, if you go to the historic site, um, we, we have it on in the, in the museum exhibit that you can read about the death of her son, Calvin Jr. Um, it, was very, it was a very, very sad period in his life. And many historians have said 
that when Calvin Jr. died, the heir sort of let out the Coolidge presidency. That's been the, the it's been a story of yes, but Calvin Jr. Well, well, other biographers like my boss, Amity Schlaes, have written that it was more a story of perseverance, but yes, because after the death of his son, he went on to a rollicking re-election in a three-way race against the Democrat and a progressive, won 54% of the vote um, in November of 1924, and then went on to pass his, his crowning achievement, the Revenue Act of 1926. So uh, different perspectives historically on that, but it's a very, very sad episode in his life. Um, and it was sadly very common for people to lose children in those days. Uh, Grace and Calvin received a lot of letters from other people who had lost kids as well. And you can go to Plymouth Notch and see all of their grave sites. Calvin Jr. is right there next to his, next to his father. Um, and then Grace and then John and his wife Florence are, are buried there as well as they both his son. So it's all right there in Plymouth Notch. So I encourage you all to visit. And also, um, I have things. Everything on this table is free. I only brought a few books to give away. So it's first come, first serve. If you want a book, please take one. Um, but thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience.